Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're going to take you through the latest features and enhancements delivered to RMS in our live product update. Now, that was our largest live product release ever. And we're really excited to show you through. As I said before, my name is Pete Ferris, and I'll be delighted to take you through with my colleagues, Jared Walls and Tom Buttigieg. Now, we're going to be recording today's session and we'll publish online along with the answered questions from today. And we'd encourage you to please share those with as many people in your team as possible if they're unable to make it today, um, just so everyone can get the most out of the new product UI update. Okay, so only a few years ago, most of us could have never imagined the year that was 2020. Times have changed, uh, your technology and operation needs are changing and RMS will continue to drive development and enhancements to meet those evolving needs. And our product teams worked really hard and tirelessly over the past six months to revolutionize RMS. And we're delighted to be able to present the new features to you today. So without further delay, we're gonna jump straight in and I'm gonna hand over to Jared to run today's presentation. And Tom and I will be in the background monitoring and answering any questions as they come up throughout. So thanks, Jared, over to you. Excellent, thanks so much, Pete. And thanks for joining everyone. As Pete mentioned, very exciting times. It's been a long time coming this release and we're very excited to show. So one of the first things hopefully most people will have noticed is the introduction of two-factor authentication. This is a feature that RMS has rolled out for our users to help protect you in these times of uh, cyber threats, particularly with everyone working from home. It's really important to not only stay secure, but to be able to manage your users and ensure they're staying secure as well. So two-factor authentication. I'll start off with a little demonstration. Now, we will talk through some of the setup items. You can download a two-factor authenticator app on your phone or tablet, which will look a little bit like this. Now, I'm just gonna log into my demo database today using two-factor to give you a little bit of a look at what it'll look like. As you can see, log in as you normally would, and then grab your code from your authenticator app. Enter that in and you're in the system. Really easy to do. Now, you can of course have some redundancies around email and text messaging for those codes. You would have seen the forgot your code uh, item on the login screen just there. I'm gonna log out again and just talk through those. Now, as you can see, when you do log in with two-factor authentication, you do have an option to trust the device for 30 days, which will be stored against the user account. And in the event that you've lost your authenticator device, you do have an option there um, to be able to recover your password, which will come out to you via text message or email. Now, I'm just gonna log in with my account to take you through some of those screens and options. And we're in our lovely new interface. Now, in regards to two-factor authentication, as I just mentioned, there are a couple of key pieces of information you need to ensure exist on all of your user accounts when utilizing this. For starters, you need to ensure that there's a mobile number. Again, this is used for recovery in the event that one of your staff do not have their authenticator app and also the email address. These can both be used at the user level to work to uh, uh, regain access to the system in the event you don't have your authenticator app open. Now, we do highly recommend as well that your system administrator or someone within your organisation has the security profile settings to be able to manage these settings moving forward as well. We'll just open up front office to have, in fact, manager would be a better one, just to have a look at these. Again, we do have a little highlight screen up the top here. So if you are looking for a specific function, you can type in a keyword and we will highlight where that keyword exists. Now, as you can see, if I type in factor for two factor, it highlights setup screens and security. And from within here, you can grant or restrict access to a user group to have access both to the security tab, which we're gonna look at shortly. And you can also give them the ability to be a two factor administrator. Let's go and have a look at the security tab now, shall we? As you can see, under setup security, you can also use the menu search to locate that quick and easy. Now, when we go into the security tab, there are a number of new options here. Uh, in fact, the whole tab is new. 
domains I won't touch on today, we do have password management. This is a really fantastic screen to help you ensure that your users are actually using strong passwords. I'll take you through a few of the different options here. For starters, we can set the number of days that a password can be valid, meaning that after this number of days passes, the user will be required to select a new password. You can delegate the minimum number of characters for the password, whether or not it contains a number, uppercase and lowercase characters, and even a special character, such as a symbol, like an exclamation, at symbol, something along those lines. You can also disable the ability to reuse previous passwords, ask new users to create a new password on their first login, and after a password reset. You can also set the minimum password attempts, meaning if they try to log in too many times with the wrong password, it will lock them out, at which point they would need to talk to their your delegated system administrator. Another great setting in here is where you can set the auto log off time. What this actually means is if someone is logged into RMS and they don't actually use the system for however many minutes you've delegated, I've got mine set to 120 minutes, it will automatically log them out. Now that's a really handy uh, feature as well in the event that perhaps you might've been logged in at home the night before or the morning before you got to work. If you've got a good value in there, then once that time elapses, when you do try to log in at work, you'll be able to get in. Now, we also have the addition of restricted IP addresses. This is where you can select and delegate a range of different IP addresses to allow access to your system. That's really useful if you have a secondary location where you want to ensure that people can still log into RMS. We also have SSO, which is single sign-on used by larger groups, and this gives them the ability to use a third party single sign on application to manage access to RMS and perhaps various other platforms that they utilize within their business. But that's a, a topic for another day. Now here's our page on two factor authentication. As you can see, you do need to be able to tick a box to enable it for your property and also enter a recovery mobile. This is really useful in the event if anybody has locked you out or you've, you've done something wrong or your uh, IP address has, for instance, reset, anything along those lines, it gives you a redundancy, a way of getting back in where RMS can send a message to the recovery mobile to grant you access back into the system, and then you can get up and running again. Now, for those of you who don't know what the acronym IP means, that's Internet Provider. Now, what we've actually done as well is given you the ability to do what we call whitelisting or an IP address bypass. Now, what this means is if you request a static IP address or dynamic IP address from your internet provider, such as Telstra or whoever gives you your internet access, you can request that they give you a, a IP address that doesn't change. Now, where this is really useful is you can go in and add an IP range in here with a description. You might call that uh, head office or something along those lines. And as you can see, if you click the use current IP, we will automatically fill that in for you. Now, once you save and exit that, when users log in from this location, they won't have to do the two-factor authentication. This way, when they're on site, and obviously you've got a busy office, you can log in quick and easy, no need to get out your authenticator app. But if someone tries to log in from a different location, they will be prompted to use the authenticator app in order to log in. So you can both be quick at the office and secure remotely. Very, very useful. Now, again, we do recommend that your recovery mobile is managed by your system administrator, which leads me into the next topic. And we're going to have a look at a new tab in RMS that we call contacts. Now this screen is only visible to your system administrator. If you need help getting initial access, you can always contact RMS support but typically the manager account will give you your original access to this screen where you can delegate the system admin. And this is typically the person who has access over security profiles, who can see and do what within your RMS system. Now, when they log into the screen, they can simply click on the little pencil and select from a list of existing users within RMS and allocate who is the system admin. That will then give them all the access they need to be able to edit these screens. 
We also have similar functions for your primary billing. That's who's going to receive copies of invoices and so forth. Your enterprise IBE critical notifications. And further to these really important places where you can say who can do what within the system, this also filters through to our client database so that we know if someone contacts support, we know that they're an authorized person for us to be able to talk to and make changes potentially. Now, further to that, we also have the general contacts list down the bottom. This is a really great list and it's important that you take time to put all of the people in your group in here that need to receive important information about RMS, such as when we send out our ADMs advising you we're going to do an upgrade or we're going to uh, release a new feature or anything along those lines, the people in this list will get those ADMs. Really valuable information and you want to ensure that you're getting that not just at the head office level, but your users as well, so they can be prepared for releases. Excellent. Thank you. We might just take a pause there and uh, just remind everybody that at the bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A button. So if there's any questions that you have about the features that are being demonstrated at the moment by Jared, please don't hesitate to ask a question and Tom and I will be happy to accommodate. Thank you, Jared. Thanks, Pete. We'll give it a minute, see if any questions show up. All quiet on the question front so far. Doing a great job, so. Good news. Well, we'll there jump we right into the toolbar at the top. This is a feature I've been very excited for. I'm sure you're all aware of the previous toolbars with the two options to switch between color and no color, but we've taken this one step further for you now. And what we've done is we've given you the ability to open up your customize icons button and you can add, remove or reorder the functions that are available on your toolbar, essentially like having bookmarks in your browser. And this is not based on security profiles or anything like that, it's at the user level. So every user can fill this up with all their favorite items, the functions that they use most regularly throughout the day, and it will just make using the system that little bit quicker and easier. Now, as always, hover your mouse over any of these items and you'll get a little bit of a description. And before you know it, you'll know what each icon represents off the top of your head really, really easily. Now, next thing I want to jump into is the new reservation screen. Now, as you can see, we've done some reformatting to the reservation screen, and we've been very mindful that there's an increase in people using mobile devices, smaller screen laptops, but not everybody. Some people also do have large screens like I have today. So with that in mind, we've had a very good focus on allowing you to either make the most of your screen space by minimizing both the tabs on the left hand side, which we've actually moved from the top to the left to help reduce the amount you may need to move your mouse. But again, it gives you this ability to collapse it as well. So when you do start to get used to these icons, you can have it minimized, more screen space for you. You'll be able to see a little indicator when there are multiple items available, such as your correspondence tab. and it'll help you navigate much faster. Now you'll also notice that we've also made the guest note, res note, OTA note section expand and collapsible as well. And also the requirements section, which now has a little three dots where you can actually add, remove or edit without even having to expand that section if you don't need to. We have also changed the functions at the very top to icons a very short hover of the mouse over each one will tell you which one is, which, which icon is what function. Doesn't take long to get used to it. Really easy to use. We've also made the reservation summary information across the top persistent so that no matter what tab you're on, you can always see that basic reservation information. We've also moved the bill to button up to the top right and made that a icon so that if you do want to edit your bill two sections for each account, you can do so with one click and see all of the various accounts you have enabled and what they're set to bill to. For those of you who aren't familiar, this is really useful in the event that you have a company or a travel agent attached to a reservation and you may, for instance, be billing the accommodation charges to a company, but the guest may be paying for the additional charges.
Now we've also added a little gear to the reservation screen for options. Each user can go and select their favorite options. And this allows you to set the defaults for how this screen is going to appear when you first log in. For instance, we may wish to have, if you're on a smaller screen, smaller fields. As you can see, one little click and the fields get that little bit smaller and can see more information on the screen. Or you can go to medium, which I prefer, or if you've got a really big screen, you can choose large. Also handy if you see a lot of fields on the screen, as I demonstrate the system quite a lot, I have just about everything exposed. Some people keep it nice and simple, in which case you may choose to choose large. Now you can also set the options around your note options and requirements and whether or not you would like those to begin closed or open when you first log into a reservation. That allows you to set your defaults that way, every time you come in, it's just how you like it. Now, another thing I wanna demonstrate for you all today is the pre-check-in and COVID health declaration via the RMS guest portal. Something we have demonstrated in the past, and while we are aware that COVID seems to be getting in control everywhere, there's still a lot of relevance behind this fantastic functionality that we provided to you all earlier in the year. And I'm just going to take you through an example of that now. One thing I do recommend is that you include a, a uh, merge field on your triggered correspondence for reservation confirmations so that when someone has made a booking, they can click on that link and it will take them directly into the guest portal. That way, when they click on their link on their mobile phone, which is what I'm emulating on the screen right now, it'll take them past the login screen and straight into the portal. Now, each one of your guests will have the ability to create a password if they wish to be logging in and out regularly. Really handy if you're using the guest portal for long-term reservations. That way someone could, for instance, save this on the home screen of their phone, come and go as they please, making payments or whatever they may be needing to do. But we'll skip that for now. Now, I'll take you through some of the options on this screen shortly. You have the ability to say how many days ahead of arrival someone can complete the pre-check-in process. And as long as they log in within the time frame you've allocated, they'll be presented with this little option to complete pre-check-in. Now, pre-check-in is essentially a way of giving your guests the ability to complete their registration process, same as you might do on a tablet or a hard copy piece of paper at a hotel. But instead of doing that on a device or something that belongs to the hotel, they can do it all on their own phones, tablets, laptops, what have you, reducing the need for people to handle uh, paper or devices and helping you stay safe throughout COVID. Now let's proceed. As you can see, first thing they'll be presented with is a brief summary of the reservation and the option to suggest who they are, whether they're the primary occupant or an additional guest at which point they can go through and enter in any information that is not already present on the reservation. Now, these fields can be modified using field maintenance within RMS, where you can say not only which fields appear, but also which are what we call mandatory, indicated by the red star, which means in order to progress, they need to ensure they've entered that piece of information in. Once the customer has completed, they hit continue. They will then be presented with a summary of their contact information and the terms and conditions for your property, which you can, of course, enter into RMS, at which point they will need to acknowledge that the information they've provided is correct. Add in a little squiggle, which will work on a touch device, of course, and proceed. Next, we get to the coronavirus declaration. Now, important point of note, you don't have to use the COVID health declaration and contact tracing. You can simply use this for pre-check-in, even check-in and paying the balance of the stay. However, at the moment in most places, it is best practice to still be doing contact tracing. So I do recommend that you do continue to use this for the time being. Jared, just a question on that. If anyone um, doesn't wish to use the COVID declaration as a part of the process, can you show the steps afterwards on what they need to do to switch that off? Yep, absolutely, Pete. We'll go through and have a look at those screens once we're complete. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so first the guest will see their coronavirus declaration, hit proceed. They are then requested to uh, provide a reason for their travel. Let's just say leisure for today. 
and then they reach the declaration itself. Now, we have built this to be exception based. And what that means is we are of the view that you don't want to review every single one of these documents that gets submitted, particularly when you're busy. You simply would only want to view the ones that have given you an answer that you may not want to accept the reservation. So in the event they provide all positive affirmations and ticks, they can proceed and it'll simply store this as a document against the reservation on the correspondence tab. However, in the event they choose a no to any of these questions, which you can customize, it's going to trigger an event in the message center, which we'll look at shortly so that you can not only review it, but reach out to that customer and have a conversation and decide whether or not you wish to accept this reservation. Now, if they say a no, they'll also get a confirmation to make sure they haven't done that by mistake. And then we can still proceed. So next step is where have they been for the past 14 days? If they've only been at the location they've provided for their address, they can simply say yes and progress. If they say no, they'll get a date for each of the 14 days prior. Enter in an address. As you can see, it uses the Google lookup to make life really easy for someone. And if they've been at multiple addresses, they can enter each one. If it's been a different location, you can the same location all the way through, you can just apply that for every date. From that point, the guest is then requested not only to confirm again their details, but this is the point where they can actually enter in the contact information of their additional guests. Again, very important for contact tracing and you're covering yourselves by presenting this technology to them to ensure that if for whatever reason there was an outbreak or a need to report to guests within a date range uh, that there was someone who, who was affected, you're going to have that information available to you. But for the purposes of speed, I'll just remove that for now. One of the final steps is to agree to comply with social, social distancing measures and good hygiene practices. The guest will be required to tick, at which point it will stamp the document with their name the date and the time, and they can complete their pre-check-in process. Very quick, very easy, and you can even customise the little confirmation message they receive at the end of this process. And again, if you've enabled the ability, they can even check themselves in from this point. We have a very strong view at the moment of automating as much as possible for you to improve your guests' experience. So let's go and have a look at where we can set some of these options. Again, I rely heavily these days on the menu search. So if we just search for portal, we can see guest portal, where we can look at these settings. Now you will need to click the enable guest portal button at the top to enable this at the start. If it is your first time using the guest portal, I do recommend that when you enable it, you create a test reservation in your own name so that you can log in just how your guests will. This is not only given, gonna give you a chance to review the settings that you've set in RMS and to view how things are gonna look, but it's gonna give you the ability if someone's having difficulty over the phone or standing opposite you in the office, it's gonna give you the ability to talk them through it. So it's important not only for you to understand how it looks and feels, but for any of your staff that might be manning the front office. Now you'll have a range of different options around how the guest portal displays, such as displaying your email address and logo, a greeting, also whether or not the guest can see their profile and make changes and so forth. You can enable or disable messaging. Now, important point of note, the messaging between the guest portal and RMS doesn't cost you anything. That's not an SMS, it's not tied to our SMS functionality. So if someone messages you from the guest portal, it'll come straight through to the message center at the top right here, and there's no charge for that additional messaging functionality. As you can see, we've already had our notification from the guest portal that this reservation, number 1066, which is the one we were just looking at, you can click on this to go straight into the reservation, by the way, has answered no to the below statement, which is we have not returned from overseas in the past 14 days. Now, when these messages come through regarding your COVID health declaration, they're what we call a persistent message, which means it's going to stay active with the notification up on the message center here until one of your staff actually clicks acknowledged, 
at which point it's going to stamp this message with the name, date and time of the user who says they've actioned it. So in a real world example, if you were going to contact this guest and discuss why they gave you a no to this statement, you could open up this reservation, go straight in there, call Mr. Walls, ask him about his experience and decide whether or not this is going to require any additional action. So it's really handy, but everyone who's filled it in and done all of the positive affirmations said, yes, we're fine. We haven't been anywhere bad. We're all okay. You don't even need to worry about it. It'll simply be stored against the correspondence tab. As you can see, COVID-19 health declaration form and registration card all accepted. You can open those at any time and view them. Now to make life a little bit easier, if you are utilizing this technology on a daily basis, in the in and out movement screen, we've also added this new statement a status of arrivals yet to complete pre-check-in. This can be really handy if you're fast approaching your check-in time of say 2 p.m. and you may note that a large number or any number of your reservations haven't yet completed this process. And what that's gonna allow you to do is select one or a combination or all of these reservations and straight from this screen, you can email, or if you're using our SMS module, you can even SMS them. A little reminder to complete this process. I'm a big fan of the SMS option, because as I said before, you can put a merge field in there where they can click on that merge field, go directly into the guest portal and complete the process. Now, even if someone has entered into the office and you're practicing a uh, social distancing and trying to keep as clean as possible, you could send them that text while they're standing opposite you so they can complete the whole process on their mobile phone. And then you can simply hand them a key, welcome them to the property and the rest of your customer experience off you go. Very easy to do. And we've given you these tools to help manage your day very, very quickly. Yeah, Jared, we've just got a couple of questions here. Um, one of the first ones we've had is, can you amend the COVID questions or the pre-arrival questions for the guest portal? Fantastic question. Thank you, Tom. Yes, we absolutely can. So let's go back into the guest portal settings and let's go through these in a little bit more detail. So as we discussed before, general options up the top here. You can also customize the terms and conditions, but let's go and look at the check-in section. This is where we initially enable the pre-check-in functionality and set how many days prior to arrival your guests can complete this process, where you can allocate the registration card that will be displayed. You can also within this screen set the payment conditions. I find this really handy because you're giving people the ability here to prepay their stay using their own phone and removing another step from the office so that that guest experience is so much smoother and easier. But if you don't want to do that, we do give you quite a bit of flexibility around how you're going to manage that. You might say no payment or credit card required. You may simply request that they enter a credit card number so it can be tokenized, useful in the event you're using a payment gateway, or pay the first deposit amount, balance of account, which is my favorite, or the total tariff. Now you can also set this to create a credit card token if the payment amount equals zero. Really handy if you like to always ensure that you've got that credit card information for incidentals or someone might extend later or potentially leave a mess and there may be a cleaning fee attached to that later. Now a question that often comes up, what do you do in the event of virtual credit card, uh, virtual bookings that have virtual credit card tokens from the OTAs and so forth? We've given the, the ability to restrict which travel agents this functionality will apply for. So you can simply say, uh, booking.com or Expedia, we want to exclude those from this process. Now, if we go across to the COVID-19 declaration, as per Tom's question, you can see we've already loaded this up with questions that we built after liaising with the state and national industry associations to best cover you. But you can edit these and even enter in a few extra questions of your own. You can also disable the need to enter in past locations if need be. And in the event you are using the full self check-in functionality, you can even delegate which room types or categories that is allowed for. In some instances, that can be useful for allowing people to check themselves in for sites, but potentially not for cabins where they may need to collect a key. So we've tried to give you a lot of flexibility around how this technology can support your business moving forward.
Excellent. Jared, one of the other questions that's come up as well is in the check-in process, if the booking originally had five guests, but the client has loaded six up through the pre-check-in process, are you going to get an alert for that? Uh, I don't think we do get an alert on that. I'll have to confirm that and we'll send that out post today, Pete. I don't know. No worries. Top of my head. Thank uh, you. I do know that it will definitely update the contacts on the reservation. So mm -hmm. when they add additional guests, even if it goes over the number you're charging for, it will add all of the contact details added by the guest portal. But we will come back on whether or not that will increase the number of people on the reservation. I believe the answer is no, but we'll confirm that for you. Okay. Any other questions around pre-check-in and the COVID declaration? Um, so the question that's come through from Caroline here, can the collection of additional guest information be added for the pre-check-in process even when not using the COVID-19 declaration? Good question. I do believe it's tied to COVID health declaration and contact tracing at the moment. Mm -hmm. I'll create another follow-up item on that as well, just to confirm 100%. No worries. We'll come back to Caroline. Thank you. And uh, can we get the car rego and give out Boomgate codes with this process or would we use the triggered correspondence for that? You can. I highly recommend using the triggered correspondence for that. Um, sorry, you can't use that use it via the uh, guest portal. But one thing I do recommend is using a triggered correspondence to automatically send out that access number. Now, an enhancement that we released last year is the ability to automatically generate Boomgate codes at the time of reservation creation. Now, real world use for this is if you set that up to SMS the access code upon check-in, that means when the guest arrives at the park and they check themselves in at the office, boom, they'll get a text message and they'll have their access code on their phone, which they're likely to have with them every time they come or go from the park. Now, one thing that's also useful for that is if you've got them self-checking in via the guest portal, and you're utilising that trigger, then yes, when they check in via the guest portal, they'll get that text message to then give them their code to get in and out through the boom gate. Thank you. Uh, and then a question from Casey, if they have paid in full, can they still complete the pre-check-in process? Absolutely, yes. Excellent. Very good. Okay, we will have some more question time at the end as well. So I might keep going with the next topic and we can always circle back. So another great release of our latest update is the addition of the module market. Now, not everybody will have seen this yet because it's only visible to the system administrator. As we discussed earlier, that's the person who's essentially responsible for managing your RMS database on behalf of your business. Now the system administrator will now see this module market available via the menu search and in your main menu here. And as you can see, essentially what we've done is we've made the ability to add on integrations, additional functions such as our electronic direct marketing module, which is the same one we use to send out information about our updates and so forth. We've essentially made those self-service. So if you do wanna add these items into your RMS instance, you can turn those on and add in any additional information required for configuration yourselves, which will make that whole process quick and easy. Now, we will be adding a lot more items to this as we proceed through the next couple of years. In fact, we'll be continuing endlessly. And as you can see, it's really quick and easy to use. You can view more info on each item, turn it on, turn it off, allowing you to make the most of your RMS instance. Even our guest rewards by points. Fantastic new mo uh, module by RMS that essentially allows you to enroll your guests into a membership platform in RMS and to accrue points as they spend, which then means they can resume, uh, redeem those points at a later date as payments against accommodation or various items that you might sell at your business. You can see we do have quite a range of different modules available in here, and you can even simply click on what is active for your database. As you can see, I've got the boom gates, guest rewards, two-way SMS, one-way SMS, which is always required to have two-way, and I've got the Google address lookup. Makes entering addresses quick and easy.
Now, the next thing I want to talk about a little bit today is triggered correspondence. Sorry, Jared, just one quick question on the module market there. Just an explanation, please, for the difference between Boomgate's RMS Direct and Boomgate's external modules, please. Oh, absolutely. So Boomgate's Direct RMS is where we are actually interfacing direct to your Boomgate's via the RMS MFI, which stands for Multifunction Interface. And this is a complete direct connection where you can open, close the gates, view all the information you need on the MFI. Now, that's our direct option, and it's only available to compatible gates. However, the external option is used for some of the gate providers that we integrate. Uh, a couple of good names that you may be familiar with are iPass and Evolution. Now, Evolution is a good example. They also have the ability to integrate with uh, cameras, for instance, that might use number plate recognition, that sort of thing, to allow automated access to the park. So people can simply come and go as they please using that camera software, rather than having to enter in a code. Thanks, Jared. Right. Ready to move on. Perfect. Okay, triggered correspondence. Now, I'm sure most of you are familiar with triggered correspondence. We've been using it for many, many years. And what we've actually done is add a new intuitive wizard to help making a trigger that little bit easier. So I'm going to use a real world example for you today, something we've seen increasing use for in the park market. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an automated follow up to a pencil reservation. In fact, before I do that, let's create a pencil reservation so we all know what we're talking about. Now you can do this right off the booking chart by simply right clicking or even dragging a date range. And provided you've got this enabled, instructions how to do so in our help center, you will have the option to add a pencil reservation, which is a tentative booking. This is some way you can enter in some basic information. And you might agree with someone over the phone that you'll hold a site for them for a period of time. Someone might say, look, we're not 100% sure, we're having a look around. Can you hold it for us for a couple of days, couple of weeks, whatever? Save and exit. And now we have a booking in place that's actually holding onto that inventory for you and it'll expire at the point that you've set it up to do so. Now, what you can do to help with these pencil reservations is set up a trigger, which is what I wanted to take you through. So if we go into triggered correspondence, and as you can see, I haven't got one of these yet, but I do have them for my reservation confirmations and my COVID health declaration. We'll add a new one. And we're gonna call this pencil follow-up. The rule, so you can set a number of different rules as to how you want your trigger to apply. This hasn't changed. And in this example, we're going to say X periods before or after an action and we will say one day before pencil expiry. You can also decide whether or not you want to send if the trigger has already passed. I always recommend leaving that blank, but it depends on what you're doing. Then you can delegate the type of correspondence you're sending, whether it be SMS, email, API, or guest portal. In this example, we're going to use SMS, from which point we can select from an existing template. I've already taken the liberty of creating a pencil follow-up text message, which essentially just says, hello, Mr. Walls, you've had a tentative booking with us. Would you like to call us to confirm with the phone number in the text message? You can also set date filters on these if you want to exclude or target specific date ranges. Leave that blank for today. You can add on some reservation filters, such as ignore, if something is marketing correspondence, you can tick that so that if you are being GDPR compliant and giving your guests the ability to opt out of marketing correspondence, they can do so. But this is operational, not marketing, so we'll leave that blank. You can ignore group masters from group reservations, only send if there is a balance on the account, even say only send to a reservation that has a minimum or maximum or a combination of night stays. You can only include reservations with specific statuses. In this event, pencil's what we're after. You can also say who you want to send it to. Primary guest is what we would be using for the pencil expire. If you're using it for something else, you may have secondary guests, companies or travel agents, other various contacts. 
Now you can also set some exclusions such as you may wish to exclude certain travel agents, room types, that kind of thing. Again, for a pencil follow-up, that's not really relevant. Click save and exit. You'll get prompted to update all existing and current future reservations with this triggered correspondence rule. That's a really important thing to note. If anybody out there is still using the standard RMS reservation confirmations and you build your own dynamic HTML ones like I have in my database, then it's really important that you enable this at the time that you create it so that any of your existing reservations in your database have this rule applied for them. It sort of says it in the name, triggered correspondence mean that, means that these will send only when the event occurs, but these triggers are only created at the time you create that reservation. So when you're prompted with that, if you want whatever you've just built to apply to all of your existing reservations, you want to say yes to that option. And that was the example on triggered correspondence. Feel free to jump in if anyone's got any questions. I'm going to jump into our new reporting module next. But no questions on triggered correspondence. Thank you. Okay, so one of the more exciting new, new features of the user interface update for RMS is we have significantly updated our reporting module. And I'm just going to take you through initially a cash transactions report. I'm sure you're all very familiar with this for your end of day process. And one of the first things you'll notice is we've gotten rid of the build and export buttons. On any report that we have migrated across to this new reporting functionality, you'll simply have the build option now. Because what we've done is we've moved all of the functions you would need to the report screen here and removed the need for smart print. Now, as I'm sure many of you re will recall, smart print was used to help delegate which items in report form will come out of which printers. But with this new reporting enhancement, if we click the print button, we get a little preview window. And because that's a browser-based window, it's immediately going to recognize what printers are available on your computer. Very easy. Now, one of the first things you'll notice with the cash transactions report in this new module is when you first build the report, everything's collapsed. You're only seeing the totals. And we did that on purpose. The view here is when you're doing your end of day reconciliation process, if you calculate up your totals and everything matches what you're expecting, beautiful, you balance, you can go and have a relax. No further action required. Now, in the event that you don't reconcile, something's out, you can go and expand any or all of these sections. As you can see, we then get a full transaction list showing all the information we saw on the previous report so that you can correct and update where needed. Now, to make life even better and more amazing again, you can actually notice that both the account numbers and res numbers are blue and underlined. And we've done that so that if you do need to make a correction, you can click directly on that res number and it's actually going to open the reservation for you. This way, while you've still got the report open on your other tab, you can go into the reservation, make any changes on the account, exit, go back to the main screen, hit build again, and it'll help make corrections much easier during your end of day process. And as you can see, you can of course have multiple sections of the page expanded at once. And print if need be. Hopefully that should make life a lot easier for people that do have a lengthy reconciliation process at the end of every day. Now I'm going to show you another example of this in the, uh, of the occupancy report. This is to help highlight why we've done this. Okay, so when we load up the occupancy report, as you can see, it's a little bit more stretched across the screen, making better use of the screen space available to you. Now it'll of course shrink down if you're on a smaller screen. We have our summarized information at the top, same as we always have graph down the bottom. Now where this becomes really, really beneficial is uh, where you want to actually understand the figures that make up your occupancy report better. For instance, you might look and notice that your beach view cabins have a much higher fi uh, figure set than any other category. You may wish to know why. So you can simply expand that room type or category 
and see all of the reservations that make up that total, allowing you to drill down and understand your data better. As you can see, quite a lot in there. You can even just peruse, perhaps there was a reservation put in by mistake with a very large number on it, or everything could be correct and you just really wanna get an understanding, uh, see your number of nights, number of occupants, gross revenue, taxes, discounts, all of that great information. We will be rolling this out on more and more reports as we progress. And again, the whole idea of this is not only to give you the ability to report on your figures, but to understand what makes them, to understand your business better and work out if one room type is performing better than others, perhaps you can start to go and look at those reservations and find out why it's performing better. Couple of great comments here, Jared. They're loving the new reports engine, so that's fantastic. Excellent, I love it myself. We're releasing all the best stuff when I don't own parks anymore. <laughs> all righty, well, we'll have some more questions in a moment. The next thing I wanted to touch on is the new RMS IBE. This is something I have been looking forward to for a long time, this is fantastic. Okay, now same as the previous IBE, you all have the ability to customize the look and feel of your IBE. Now, I'm just gonna to touch on that for a couple of minutes, um, just to give you a few little tips from my experience of using the IBE. As you can see, this is just my demo database. I've put on my own logos, descriptions, background photos. I've even customized the color of the buttons. Now, let's just have a look at where we do that. So we go to setup, online bookings, and then online options. We go to color theme. Now, if you haven't been in here and customized before, you will likely be set to default, which is the default RMS colors look and feel. All you've got to do is make sure if you're in an enterprise database, you select the appropriate property and select the option of custom. As you can see, you'll then be presented with a preview of how things are going to look with the settings you're entering. And from here, you can start to modify the header property name, buttons, and call to action button with colors. As you can see, you can go through with RGB settings if you like. One thing I find really beneficial is if you press this button a couple of times, you can find out what the hex code is. For those of you who don't know, this is a graphic design term, and this allows you to actually mirror the colors of your branding of your business perfectly. So you could use something like Microsoft Paint, or any good screen capture technology to take a screen capture of your website, use the little eyedropper to take a, a, a drop of the sample color you're trying to replicate, and then you'll have a field in that graphic design program called hex, and that is this color here, which will then enable you to mirror the colors of your website on the buttons, toolbars, and so forth of your IBE, really giving you that ability to keep the same look and feel of your website on the RMS IBE so that people feel like they're still on the same location. Helps increase uh, consumer confidence during that process. Okay, let's do a little bit of a walkthrough of this. Now, as per the previous iterations of the IBE, we can enter in a date range. Now, I hope a lot of you have taken the time to do this because it's fantastic functionality. Based on your setup in RMS, if you set the classifications of your room types, to site and accommodation, you can actually allocate the types of caravans available on any site. You can do this for every single site. So for instance, on your smaller sites, you would allocate them available for tent, but you might also make them available on the larger ones. But on a really, really big site would be the only one you would allow a fifth wheeler. On a small site, you would not make that relevant. And these are not just filters. This means that when a customer goes through and enters in this information during the booking process, they will only be allocated a site in RMS that they can fit on. And you can also choose the lengths there. Now, we didn't custom fill this up with all these different types and lengths. That's something you can do yourself. So once you've taken the time to decide what types of vans and sizes on each specific site, you can take the time to go and enter those into RMS on each area. And if there's interest in that, we'd be happy to run another webinar at a later date and do a bit of a deep dive into how to set all of that up. Now, for the purpose of example, I'm just going to do accommodation today. As you can see, much like the previous IBE, you'll be presented with a list 
of the various room types available with the accommodation classification on them. You can upload photos and I do recommend getting really great photos on here for a slideshow. Uh, this is your chance to sell to your customers. So uh, as the saying goes, a picture's worth a thousand words. You'll be able to see the name of the cabin, customize the descriptions and so forth. We have added in a new availability calendar. This is really handy if someone wants to spy and see if there's some cheaper dates or modify their dates. They can view the rate types available if there are various rates that are available. And when they do select to add some accommodation, it now populates into a shopping cart. Fantastic little addition. And this makes doing group reservations so much easier. So now someone can come through here and book multiple sites at once. We've also added in some validation so that if you have set the maximum number of people that an accommodation can uh, accommodate, then if they enter in eight adults at the top and hit the add button here, you'll get a little pop up to say, you will need two cabins for eight people. So then they can click, yep, I'll take two, add to reservation and proceed. Now, one of the best additions to this IBE is this release is also the ability to add extras. This is your chance to upsell during the IBE. Now this leverages off your requirements in RMS. And again, same as adding the, the pictures to your room types and categories. You can also upload pictures for your requirements. I do recommend high resolution, really good looking pictures. And people can now go and add any of these items to their booking during the online booking process. In the event that it's a group reservation, it'll even ask them which room the extra item pertains to. Now, one of the benefits of these being requirements in RMS is you can, of course, monitor your requirements. So you could have a scheduled report going out to a groundsman to say, we need two fire pits delivered to this reservation and a bag of firewood. And then he'll know he has to do that in the morning. And then the following day, you can even have an item there to collect those. There's no limit to how many items you can add to this screen. You could even add things in such as uh, early arrival or late checkout that won't update on the reservation screen, but you can certainly start to sell those pieces of information and then use your um, scheduled reports to keep an eye on things. Now, once you've got everything you're purchasing set up in your little shopping cart, you can hit make reservation. This will take us to the summary page. The guest can now edit the reservation again from there, which will take them back a step. They can enter in their contact information. Now, important to be aware, this all works via field maintenance. As I discussed a little bit earlier on the guest portal, we give you the ability to control not only what fields appear on this screen, but what's mandatory indicated by the red star, meaning you have to put information in that field in order to proceed. I demonstrate with my system on a daily basis, so I keep it nice and simple. A guest will have to agree to your terms and conditions and cancellation policy in order to proceed. You can of course populate all of this in your online option settings, which we'll look at again in a minute. And then I have my database integrated with a payment gateway. This is something I highly recommend for everyone. This gets you out of scope for PCI compliance which is PCI compliance is essentially an agreement that you enter into with your merchant, where you state that you will take the relevant measures to keep their credit card information secure. Now, if you're not using a payment gateway, that means things like antivirus and firewalls and making sure that staff log out of the system every time they walk away from the computer. A lot of work has to go into that. So this is a great way of getting out of scope. And this is why we shell out to their pages so that this is all wind cave stuff here. When, you're when a customer is entering in this credit card information, they're going straight into WinCave field. Please don't use my credit card. Now, as you can see, we put in the payment information, hit submit, that's going to charge the card immediately, generate a credit card token and attach it to that reservation so that you can charge it again at a later date if need be. And that token will be valid as long as that credit card is valid. Now, no sooner do you see this landing page, do we have our confirmation ID, which means that reservation is immediately searchable within RMS. We will get a fantastic new little ability here to add the reservation to calendar. So your guests can simply go bang. I wanna add this to my Google calendar and not forget my stay at property one. We get a summary of the reservation details, a breakdown of the fees and charges, a link to go into the guest portal. We can also have travel directions. This is leveraging off 
the location and contact information you've set up in property information in RMS. If you've got any special requirements set up, they will display. We'll also have our terms and conditions viewable again. And of course, this whole screen can be printed by the customer via the print button at the top right. Now it's been a resounding success, the release of the new IBE. We've already seen a 26% increase uh, of November uh, compared to uh, November 2019. So reservations are being made more than ever via the new IBE. So it's absolutely worth it. I know everyone wants to encourage direct bookings, take the time to go and do your customizations, get some great photos up in here, get some great copy up in here so that it reads really well, add some requirements, sell extra items, and get more money and get more bookings direct to your property rather than all the OTAs. Um, thanks, Jared. Uh, a question that's come in from one of the attendees today is just to, if we can do a brief rundown of how to set up sizes, which can be exposed on the IBE. Absolutely. So to do that, I'm just going to into setup and then category slash area. And one of the first things to be aware of is, as I discussed earlier, the the classification is what will decide whether or not a room type will appear in the accommodation section or the site section of your IBE. Let's just have another very quick look at that. So that's these fields here. Site will show everything that has site in the classification. Accommodation will have everything that is set for accommodation. Facility is for our facility booking pages. Another great piece of functionality, we'll run a webinar on at a later date. But let's jump into our powered sites and have a little bit of a look. And we'll go into the area. Now, important to be aware, we set these at the area level, not the category level, because you wouldn't be setting these for every single site. Very rare. I don't think I've ever seen a park where all of the site sizes were exactly the same. And we're going to go to the caravan options section on the right. And as you can see, this is where we can start to see the different lengths whether they're available or not available. If, for instance, you do not want a 45 footer on a, site, on a site, you move that back to the available so that it's not allocated. Allocated are the options that will appear when someone tries to book Howard Site 9. You can also allocate the types here as well. We don't want the fifth wheeler on here. And also the slides, which I don't have enabled on this, Slides is a way of saying what side of the van they can exit on. Uh, it's, it's used a little bit more in the USA than it is in Australia, but if you have any sites that are a little bit uh, perhaps pressed up against a fence or close to the entryway of your property and you'd prefer that they opened out to the other side, you can also delegate which sides are available for access on the site. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we don't preload these pieces of information. Um, because every park is different. You want the ability to put them in yourself. So these leverage off what we call lookup tables in RMS. We'll have a little bit of a look at those now. So lookup tables can be found in setup. This pertains to a lot of different things, not only your caravan lengths and types, but things like uh, reasons. You could be using reasons for refunds and so forth. Any of those items where you want to create a, a list of customized information in RMS, this is where you would do so. So as you can see, we go to the caravan type section and we can see all of the different caravan types I've made available to allocate to my areas. It's as simple as clicking the add button and it's just a label and whether or not you want it to be visible within RMS online. Works absolutely the same for the caravan lengths. As you can see, these are just free type fields. You can type it in however you would like it represented on your booking page. Excellent. So for a user that's looking to add that to their IBE, they would come in here and create the list of caravan links and check the boxes to show that they're in RMS online. Once they've created them in the lookup tables, then they'd go to the individual areas under the category setup and they would assign the relevant links that are permitted for each of the individual properties. Spot on, Ben. Excellent. Fantastic. So I hope that they answer that questions, but I think there's um, a lot of people that are interested to know more about different customizations. So as you suggest, we'll look at doing a separate uh, IBE um, webinar for the users to be able to show them through the different features that are there. Something else that's come up as well as a question. Um, 
if the availability calendar isn't currently visible on the IBE, is that something that can be switched at a, um, a settings permission level? Uh, fantastic question. Not 100% sure off the top of my head, then we'll have a see what we can see in the page settings. Yes, absolutely. So if you go into setup online bookings and online options, you will notice once you select the correct property and go to the page settings tab, on the bottom right here, we have calendar settings, use availability calendar. So that can be enabled or disabled. And you can also set which tariff type you want to lead in with. So the first one visible. Excellent. Thank you. Um, another question that's come through just in regards to links and whatnot is whether or not those links go through to channels like netrooms or topden.co.nz. And I think that would largely depend on each of the individual OTAs and what information they can accept. That's correct, it does. Um, so from my understanding, these are only available via RMS online at this stage. Um, but we can certainly look into if they need to be exposed for some other channels. That's, that wouldn't particularly be a difficult thing. Um, it would just come down to customer demand more than anything else. And obviously the ability for those OTAs to be able to accept those and display them on their user interfaces. Absolutely. That would be the very first point of call. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Um, that is the last question that's come up about the IBE for now. So I thought that um, that kind of covers off the most important things that we wanted to cover on today's call, but I think that there's probably two things that we might want to circle back on and then we'll open up the floor to any specific questions. And this question that's just come up there, what is the IBE? That's the RMS Internet Booking Engine. Um, so what Jared was displaying last time, the booking button, as it's sometimes referred to, or the book now button, um, an IBE is short for Internet Booking Engine. But just circling back, I think, Jared, on two uh, important things that it's worth having a quick chat about is the uh, keyboard shortcuts, because I think that's an often overlooked, really handy feature. So in RMS itself, you'll see on screen here, you've got a series of keyboard shortcuts that you can use. So for instance, if you were to push the F2 key on your keyboard, that's going to bring up the quick account access window. So you see here, this was designed for people that are looking to access an account specifically. So if you type in the res number or the account number, for instance, it means that you can go straight into that specific uh, reservation or straight into that specific account number. So really handy if someone's ringing up to query an invoice and they wanted to go in and directly into the account and have a look at that. The next one is our F3 button, which is our side menu reservation search or global search. So the F3 button is going to move your cursor into the global search field up the top. So if you're on the phone with someone and they say to you, I'd like to talk to you about my reservation, you can hit the F3 button. Your cursor will go straight up to that global search field, type in the name you're looking for and hit enter and see the results. And then we have number four, or F, sorry, F4, I should say, which is add a reservation. So that's going to open up a blank, a blank reservation window for you to be able to put a new booking in. And we've got F number five, F5, to be able to go straight into the booking chart. On that F4, uh, Pete, sorry? Um, in the event that you have auto load quick quote screen when making a reservation, that will also open up the quick quote screen for you automatically. Excellent. Thank you. So F5 to go straight into the booking chart. And we've got F7 to go straight into a guest search. We've got F8 to go into monitored requirements. So any monitored requirements for the day. And F9 to the quick quote screen. So these are some great keyboard shortcuts that people can use to be able to go into their favorite features or tools. And certainly as you're getting the hang of the new icon system as well, those function keys or short keyboard shortcuts can certainly make life a lot easier. Now, if you want to go to the uh, RMS Help Center, Jared on screen, and there is a specific article, which if you search for keyboard shortcuts, And the article that will come up will list all of the available shortcuts for you. So we'd recommend you share that article amongst your team as well. Excellent. And then the last thing I thought we'd do is just a quick final recap 
on the reservation screen, which is obviously one of the most important screens. And we've had a, a number of people that have joined the webinar a little bit later um, and may have missed that at the beginning. So just a, a quick run through top to bottom of the configuration and the new icon layouts. Fantastic, thanks Pete. All right, so let's start at the very start, which is the customization options. So for every user using RMS, you will have the little gear available at the top right to select the defaults. And this is how you would like this screen to appear for yourself when you log in. As you can see, you'll have options over the size of the fields. You can go small if you'd like to have as many fields as possible visible, medium or large, depending on how many fields you have exposed and the size of the screen that you're viewing on. You can also set the defaults around the note options and requirements as to whether or not you would like those to be expanded or contracted when you first enter the reservation. These are down the bottom now, as you can see, guest note, res note, OTA note, all collapsed, and we can expand by clicking the little up arrow. Same with requirements. It'll still stay small if there's nothing in there. And we now have the little three dots at the right where you can add, edit, remove, print, or even have templated requirements you may wish to add to a reservation. We have also moved the tabs that used to live across the top of the reservation to the left-hand side. This is done not only to help you maximize the use of your screen space by being able to collapse down to icon view, which you'll get used to very, very quickly, but also to reduce movement of the mouse. It takes less to move up and down as it does to move all the way across the top of the screen. We've also moved the reservation summary information to the top and that is now persistent. So regardless of what tab you're viewing, you will always see that basic reservation data at the top of the screen. Really handy if you're editing multiple reservations at once, jumping from tab to tab, it'll help you avoid editing the wrong tab or the wrong reservation. Now, as many people are also aware, we've also replaced the named buttons with icons. And all you got to do is hover your mouse over any one of these icons to recognize for the uh, name of the function to be displayed. And believe me, it doesn't take long at all to get used to them. They actually make a lot of sense when you get used to them. Uh, as you can see, change status is the little bell, like a little check-in bell. The gear is for options. The card is for your pre-auth token. Credit card tokens are stored on the left here. We also have the little hammer, which is for job management or maintenance as it used to be called. We also have the little in arrow with a door for check-in, a little squiggle for registration card, little copy, save button, save and exit, and also just the exit button. Excellent. And if you just want to collapse down the hamburger menu and the also uh, side menu as well, I think this is uh, really great for people to get a sense of just the hamburger menu on the top by pushing the RMS logo. Uh -huh. There we go. So you see that gives you a really clean view. You can still see all of your icons on the left hand side. So if you need to get to another chart window, etc. on the hamburger menu, you can click on one of the icons to make it appear. But by collapsing the hamburger menu and the side menu on the reservation screen, it gives you lots of visible and available space to work on. So people are really enjoying being able to do that and collapse all of the various menus if they're not required. Excellent. Okay, well, I think that pretty much covers us for today in terms of what we were wanting to discuss on the webinar. And thank you everyone for the fantastic questions that have been coming through. We'll get those, uh, any outstanding items followed up uh, with the individuals and we'll also get a copy of today's recording, uh, including the Q and A's up on our website and on our YouTube channel. We just remind everybody, um, as we said at the beginning of the call to head into the new uh, contacts tab and add as many of your users as possible to that contact list so we can communicate and get important information on product updates and new features and enhancements as they're delivered. Um, and likewise, we ask everybody to subscribe to our YouTube channel and our social media channels for regular updates as well. Now, there's one final question that's come in, uh, which we'll answer for today. Thank you, Sharon. So where do you add the CC details for authorizations, icons, top right side, near options, etc.? So the credit card details for pre-authorizations, Jared. For well, pre-auths is the little credit card up the top right here. As you can see, hover the mouse, CC pre-auth token. 
And you can also customize from property information. We'll have a look at it at the moment, the amount that you're going to capture for your pre-auth. That will then shell out to your payment gateway. Done. Excellent, thank you. And a couple more just starting to drop in. Uh, one more question here. We've got how do you change the fields in the digital registration? Uh, field for that, so the actual digital registration? Yeah, and I'm pretty sure that's a structured template that we work from at the moment as opposed to the individual registration card. So we'll come back, Kay, with a specific answer on, on that one. That's but right. there is, you've got the options there. Great. So uh, a really, we, we try to keep everything in the one place in RMS so that you're not having to jump from screen to screen. So when it comes to what we call field maintenance, this screen is used for everywhere we give you the ability to customise not only what fields appear, but what's mandatory as we talk about quite regularly. So in here, you'll see manager, which is the default right across your database. You'll see the client portal or guest portal, corporate portal, digital registration card, which was just asked, and RMS online and even specific users and so forth. Now, from this screen, you can enable or disable any of these fields. I think there's a couple of system ones like the res number that you have to keep visible. You can also set whether it's mandatory, but also when it's mandatory. For instance, you may just want to get basic information on save, but ensure that you get the rest of that information when the guest checks in. So as you can see, we did add another status to this last year so that you may want to ensure that you've got the mobile number and email when the guest actually arrives and checks in. But for the purpose of just making a reservation, you're keeping it pretty simple. And you can, of course, select any of these fields and move them up and down in the display order previewed on the right hand side. Excellent. And then on the digital registration card. Yep, this one here. Being temperamental for me today. And works just the same. So the option to switch the fields from uh, on and off on the very left hand side under visible fields and then the option to manage on save or on check-in. Correct. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Tom, are there any other questions uh, that you wanted to ask Jared before we wrap up today's presentation? Uh, I have no more. We had a question regarding the links um, for the OTA or for the IBE. Do those links that you put into RMS push through to OTAs like Netrooms and the top 10 website? Yeah, thank you. We covered that one off where um, where it ultimately depends on what the individual OTAs can handle. Um, so we're going to look into some specifics with the online team and see if any of them are capable of handling to receive those. Excellent. Okay. I think that um, that concludes today's session. If there's no other questions to come through. Thank you everybody for your time. Um, as I said, we're gonna set up a second session uh, to talk all things IBE in the very near future. Um, and just a reminder for everyone to register their information under the contacts tab so we can send you regular updates on the product. Thank you everybody. And we'll speak with you soon. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, Tom. Thanks. Thanks.